grace and mercy and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. The text is from the book of Hebrews, the fifth chapter. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So what is a priest and how do you become one? Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church all claim that it's apostolic succession. Christ to Peter and Peter to the priest. The Lutheran Church believes that Christ gave the authority to to forgive or to retain sins to the apostles. The apostles gave that authority to the church. Jesus took his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi, way up north, way up where, the, where he was transfigured, beyond that, a pagan place. It was the third year of his seminary training with them. They were in a remote place among pagan people, and he asked the final seminary question to them, who do people say that I am? And they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, some say other prophets. Then came the really pointed question. Who do you say that I am? Of course, it's a question that we are obligated to answer ourselves. Next Sunday's Palm Sunday, we're going to ask the confirmation class. Not as babies, not answered by their sponsors, but as adults. Who do you say that I am? And we expect them to answer, I would rather die than fall away from my Lord Jesus Christ. Who possesses the authority? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Christ answered, very good answer. You nailed it, Peter. And a few minutes later, Jesus explained he was going to now turn his head like Flint to Jerusalem, where he would be butchered and crucified and killed and buried and rise on the third day, and Peter said, never. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. That's how quickly that conviction went away. Well, we also must answer the question, who do you say that I am? They were on the high mountain, they were alone, they were among pagan people, those who believed in stars and sun and moon and Greek mythology and Roman soldiers and Greeks and Gentiles who believed everything that came into their head. And this small band, they say as few as 70 people in the beginning, were willing to answer, yes, we believe you are the Son of God. Jesus called Peter, you are the purveyor of this rock-like collection. He said, and you are Peter, and upon the rock of this confession I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, there's some discussion among theologians as to how that grammar is to be interpreted because if you look at the Greek closely, it says, you are Peter, small rock, 
but upon the boulder of your confession, the rock of your confession, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted, and whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. I noticed this morning you made your confession altogether. You stood up to do it. I, poor miserable sinner, and after that the pastor said, I, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce forgiveness. I forgive you all your sins. Where did he get the authority to do that? There he sits. <laughs> name is Bucklew. How can he stand up there and say, I forgive you all your sins? Where does he get that authority? Where'd you get it? You know, don't you? Got it from you. Christ gave the authority to retain or forgive sins to the people. And on a particular day, you gave it to the priest. You gave it to the pastor. The pastor has no authority to forgive sins apart from the forgiveness authority bestowed upon you on that day when he said, you're Peter, and I'd like the church to own this authority. So don't ever let a pastor lord it over you, okay? We are servants. We are the under-shepherds. We are the sheepdogs of the flock. And we only have the authority that you gave us. And you only have the authority that Jesus gave you. That he gave Peter. That he gave the disciples. It's a pretty big deal, this priestly thing. Because if you believe it, it's more powerful than your wife saying, I'm sorry, you saying, I, I forgive you. Every time you come here and confess your sins, the slate is wiped clean. Do you remember how, no, most of you don't. We used to have graphite chalkboards. We had real chalk. Some of you are shaking your head. Yeah, you remember. But when you took that eraser and you wiped it clean, it wasn't quite clean. It wasn't quite. You had to take a wet cloth and wipe it if you really wanted it to come up black and then dry up gray. But this is different. Every time you come here, that's why we encourage you to come. Every time you come here, the blackboard is black and the slate is clean and you go home sinless. That's a pretty big deal, isn't it? And you appoint priests, pastors, with the authority to say that to you. God intends to percolate his truth through living people. That's why when you and your neighbor have a Donnybrook, and one of you has the courage and the personal integrity, to go to the other and say, I'm sorry. Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes it's hard even in the family. I'm sorry comes out with difficulty sometimes. I'm sorry. You notice how you can tell by the tone of the voice if they really are? I'm really sorry. On the night my father died, a nurse came out of the room where he was fresh dead. And she said, I'm really sorry. She had a tear on her cheek. And I knew that she was. You husbands, you wives, you know the tone of the voice when your husband says, I'm sorry. You know the tone of the voice. And your wife says, I'm sorry. You know the tone of the voice when your child says, I'm sorry. They know your tone. And you say, I forgive you. Now, that's a combination that must happen. And you put that all in a glad bag, and you take it out the street and leave it there, and you don't bring it up. Remember when. This is what's offered here, besides some songs and some readings and so forth. 
actual clean slate. There's a story attached here about Abram and Lot, 1,800 years before Christ. It's about 4,000 years ago now, but it's still a relevant story. You know, there came a time when Abraham, it wasn't Abraham yet, it was Abram, because God had not made his final covenant with him. Abram and Lot were standing on a mountain looking over the land, and the, their hired men had been fighting over the water. And Lot said, we really should split up. Abram said, yes, we don't want our men fighting over the water. Abram looked out and said, Lot, you take whatever you want. You want the fertile Jordan Valley? Go ahead. Lot said, okay, I'll take the fertile Jordan Valley. Abraham said, okay, then I'll take the mountains. A lot more difficult to cultivate rice there, but never mind. Abram took the mountains. He made his camp at Shechem, where the great oak trees are. He finally buried his wife. He's finally buried. Then the kings of the north, and in those days there were city kings. They had fortifications like you see in, in Slovakia now and in Europe with the castles on top of high hills. And the peasants would run to the castle and the peasants would support the castle. The castle would support the peasants with fighting men. So there was, there was little kingdoms all over the place. Well, five of those powerful kingdoms that came out of Babylon, came out of Syria, came out of Assyria, those north and eastern kingdoms came to war, and they came to war against the Jordan Valley. Where Lot lived with his wife and two daughters in Sodom. He came to war against Sodom and Gomorrah and Zoar and one other little village. They roundly defeated them. They carried off Lot and his wife and his daughters and all their stuff and all the stuff from all the kings who ruled in the Jordan Valley. Carried it 318 miles to the north. Abram looked that over and said, I can't let it stand. So he gathered his 300 fighting men. He's, Abram was wealthy by now. They went after him. 318 miles. They decided to attack at night. They split their force into two forces. And with the surprise, at midnight, they routed them. Defeated all five kings, the Cardalermore kings. Brought the plunder and the loot and the booty and the slaves and the gold back. And on the way, they came past Jerusalem, but then it was called Salem. There was a king there an ancient king, 2,000 years before Christ. He came out to meet them. In those days, it was the custom to meet and greet a victorious army with bread and wine. Interesting, bread and wine, the substance that you're going to participate in in Holy Communion, only in an elevated way. When I went to Slovakia, we started the school at Tisovets. The mayor of Tisovets came out with bread and salt to greet us, the substance of life, to welcome us into the town. So Melchizedek comes out and says, I greet you, sir. Blessed be Abraham by God the Most High. Now this is Melchizedek we've never heard from before. And we never hear from again until two and a half thousand years he shows up in Hebrews. Blessed are you, Abraham, son of the most high God of heaven and earth, who delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram offers Melchizedek one-tenth of all of the produce of his battle.
Interesting that the suggested amount of our tithe is one-tenth. And we don't hear from Melchizedek again. Until it turns out that Christ himself, his fabulous confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, after the order of Melchizedek, who's a priest forever, before Aaron, before Levi, before Moses, is Melchizedek a priest, and a priest is one who is bodily displayed in Christ. He's the one who carries the blood of the innocent lamb into the Holy of Holies, this arch above me. If there were a curtain here, this would be the Holy of Holies. The curtain's gone now because when Christ died, it was torn in half. That's why you are welcome up into the Holy of Holies called the chancel. That's why when this diatribe is done, you're going to come up here and participate in bread and wine, body and blood. But the difference is Christ, the great high priest, carried his own body and his own blood as a sacrifice on the altar of God. So that all of our sins all of our dirtiness, all of our filthiness, all of our evil thoughts, all of our bad stuff would be wiped clean. When you know the whole story, it's pretty amazing. Amen. The peace of God that passes our understanding binds your hearts in Christ. Amen. <laughs>